Disc 28, The Amazing Maurice and His Educated Rodents By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 2x12 They'd have been really amazed if they'd ever found out that the, that the rats and the piper met up with a cat somewhere in the bushes out of town, and solemnly counted out the money. Bad Blintz was waking up when Maurice entered with the kid. No one bothered them, although Maurice got a lot of interest. This did not worry him. He knew he was interesting. Cats walked as if they owned the place anyway, and the world was full of stupid-looking kids and people weren't rushing to see another one. It looked as though today was a market day, but there weren't many stalls and they were mostly selling, well, junk. Old pans, pots, used shoes, the kind of things people have to sell when they're short of money. Maurice had seen plenty of markets, on their journeys through other towns, and he knew how they should go. There should be fat women selling chickens, he said. And people selling sweets for the kids, and ribbons. Tumblers and clowns. Even weasel jugglers, if you're lucky. There's nothing like that. There's hardly anything to buy, by the look of it, said the kid. I thought you said this was a rich town, Maurice. Well, it looked rich, said Maurice. All those big fields in the valley, all those boats on the river, you'd think the streets d be paved with gold. The kid looked up. Funny thing, he said. What? The people look poor, he said. It's the buildings that look rich. And they did. Maurice wasn't an expert on architecture but the wooden buildings had been carefully carved and painted. He noticed something else, too. There was nothing careful about the sign that had been nailed up on the nearest wall. It said. Rats wanted dead. Fifty pence per tail. Apply to. The rat catcher C slash O the rot house the kid was staring at it. They must really want to get rid of their rats here said Maurice, cheerfully. No one has ever offered a reward of half a dollar a tail, said the kid. I told you this would be the big one, said Maurice. We'll be sitting on a pile of gold before the week's out. What's a rat house, said the kid, doubtfully. It can't be a house for rats, can it? And why is everyone staring at you? I'm a handsome-looking cat said Maurice. Even so, it was a little surprising. People were nudging one another and pointing at him. You'd think they'd never seen a cat before, he muttered, staring at the big building across the street. It was a big, square building, surrounded by people, and the sign said. Rot house. Rathaus is just the local word for, like the council house, the town hall he said. It's nothing to do with rats, amusing though it may be. You really know a lot of words, Maurice, said the kid, admiringly. I amaze myself, sometimes, said Maurice. A queue of people were standing in front of one huge open door. Other people, who had presumably done whatever it was the queue was queuing to do, were emerging from another doorway in ones and twos. They were all carrying loaves of bread. Shall we queue up too, said the kid. I shouldn't think so, said Maurice, carefully. Why not? See those men on the door. They look like watchmen. They've got big truncheons. And everyone's showing them a bit of paper as they go past. I don't like the look of that, said Maurice. That looks like government to me. We haven't done anything wrong, said the kid. Not here, anyway. You never know, with governments. Just sit still here, kid. I'll take a look. People did look at Maurice when he stalked into the building, but it seemed that in a town beset by rats a cat was quite popular. A man did try to pick him up, but lost interest when Maurice turned and clawed the back of his hand. The queue wound into a big hall and passed in front of a long trestle table. There, 
each person showed their piece of paper to two women in front of a big tray of bread, and were given some bread. Then they moved on to a man with a vat of sausages, and got considerably less sausage. Watching over all this, and occasionally saying something to the food servers, was the mayor. Maurice recognized him instantly because he had a gold chain around his neck. He had run across a lot of mayors since working with the rats. This one was different from the rest. He was smaller, far more worried, and had a bald spot that he'd tried to cover with three strands of hair. He was a lot thinner than other mayors Maurice had seen, too. He didn't look as if he'd been bought by the ton. So, food is scarce, Maurice thought. They're having to ration it out. Looks like they'll be, needing a piper any day now. Lucky for us we arrived just in time. He walked out again, but this time a bit faster, because he realized that someone was playing a pipe. It was, as he feared, the kid. He'd put his cap on the ground in front of him, and had even accumulated a few coins. The queue had bent round so that people could hear him, and one or two small children were actually dancing. Maurice was only an expert on cat singing, which of standing two inches in front of other cats and screaming at them until they give in. Human music always sounded thin and watery to him. But people tapped their feet when they heard the kid play. They smiled for a while. Maurice waited until the kid had finished the tune. While the cue was clapping, he sidled up behind the kid, brushed up against him and hissed, Well done, fish for brains. We're supposed to be inconspicuous L come on, let's go. Oh, grab the money, too. He led the way across the square until he stopped so suddenly that the kid almost trod on him. Whoops, here comes some more government, he said. And we know what these are, don't we? The kid did. They were rat catchers, two of them. Even here, they wore the long dusty coats and battered black top hats of their profession. They each carried a pole over one shoulder from which dangled a variety of traps. From the other shoulder hung a big bag, the kind you really wouldn't want to look inside. And each man had a terrier on a string. They were skinny, argumentative dogs, and growled at Maurice when they were dragged past. The queue cheered as the men approached, and clapped when they both reached into their bags and held up a couple of handfuls of what looked, to Maurice, like black string. 200 today, shouted one of the rat catchers. One of the terriers lunged at Maurice, tugging frantically on its string. The cat didn't move. Probably only the stupid looking kid heard him say, in a low voice, heel, flea bag. Bad dog. The terrier's face screwed up in the horribly worried expression of a dog trying to have two thoughts at the same time. It knew cats shouldn't talk and this cat had just talked. It was a terrible problem. It sat down awkwardly and whined. Maurice washed himself. It was a deadly insult. The rat catcher, annoyed at such a cowardly performance from his dog, jerked it away. And dropped a few of the black strings. Rat tails, said the kid. They really must have a problem here. A bigger one than you think said Maurice, staring at the bunch of tails. Just pick those up when no one's looking, will you? The kid waited until people weren't looking towards them, and reached down. Just as his fingers touched the tangle of tails a large, shiny black boot trod heavily on it. Now, you don't want to go touching them, young sir, said a voice above him. You can get plague, you know from rats. It makes your legs explode. It was one of the rat catchers. He gave the kid a big grin, but it was not a humorous one. It smelled of beer. That's right, young sir, and then your brains come down your nose, said the other rat catcher, coming up behind the kid. You wouldn't dare use your hanky, young sir, 
if you got the plague. My associate has as usual put his finger right on it, young sir, said the first rat catcher, breathing more beer into the kid's face. Which is more than you'd be able to do, young sir, said rat catcher too, because when you get the plague, your fingers go all your legs haven't exploded, said the kid. Maurice groaned. It was never a good idea to be rude to a smell of beer. But the rat catchers were at the stage where, against all the odds, they thought they were funny. Ah, well said, young sir, but that's because lesson one at the guild of rat catchers school is not letting your legs explode, said rat catcher one. Which is a good thing cause the second lesson is upstairs, said rat catcher two. Oh, I am a one, aren't I, young sir? The other rat catcher picked up the bundle of black strings, and his smile faded as he stared at the kid. Ain't seen you before, kid, he said, and my advice to you is, keep your nose clean and don't say nothing to nobody about anything. Not a word. Understand. The kid opened his mouth, and then shut it hurriedly. The rat catcher grinned his awful grin again. Ah. You catch on quick, young sir, he said. Perhaps we'll see you around, eh? I bet you'd like to be a rat catcher when you grow up, eh, young sir, said rat catcher too, patting the kid too heavily on the back. The kid nodded. It seemed the best thing to do. Rat catcher one leaned down until his red, pockmarked nose was an inch away from the kid's face. If you grow up, Young sir, he said. The rat catchers walked away, dragging their dogs with them. One of the terriers kept looking back at Maurice. Very unusual rat catchers they have hereabouts, said the cat. I haven't seen rat catchers like them before, said the kid. They looked nasty. Like they enjoyed it. I haven't seen rat catchers who've been so busy but still have nice clean boots said Maurice. Yes, they did, didn't they? said the kid. But even that's not as odd as the rats round here, said Maurice, in the same quiet voice, as though he was adding up money. What's odd about the rats, said the kid. Some of them have very strange tails, said Maurice. The kid looked around the square. The queue for bread was still quite long and it made him nervous. But so did the steam. Little bursts of it puffed up from gratings and manhole covers all over the place, as if the whole town had been built on a kettle. Also, he had the distinct feeling that someone was watching him. I think we ought to find the rats and move on, he said. No, this smells like a town with opportunities, said Maurice. Something's going on and when something's going on, that means someone's getting rich, and when someone's getting rich, I don't see why that shouldn't be Emma's. Yes, but we don't want those people killing dangerous beans and the rest of them. They won't get caught, said Maurice. Those men wouldn't win any prizes for thinking. Even ham pork could run rings round M, I'd say. And Dangerous Beans has got brains coming out of his ears. I hope not. Nah, nah, said Maurice, who generally told people what they wanted to hear, I mean our rats can outthink most humans, okay? Remember back in Scrit when sardines got in that kettle and blew a raspberry at the old woman when she lifted the lid? Ha, even ordinary rats can outthink humans. Humans think that just because they're bigger, they're better hold on, I'll shut up, someone's watching us. A man carrying a basket had stopped on his way out of the rot house and was staring at Maurice with a good deal of interest. Then he looked up at the kid and said, good ratter, is he? I'll bet he is, a big cat like that. Is he yours, boy? Say yes, Maurice whispered. Sort of, yes, said the kid. He picked Maurice up. I'll give you five dollars for him, said the man. 
Ask for 10, Maurice hissed. He's not for sale, said the kid. Idiot. Maurice purred. Seven dollars, then, said the man. Look, I'll tell you what I'll do, four whole loaves of bread, how about that? That's silly. A loaf of bread shouldn't cost more than twenty pence, said the kid. The man gave him a strange look. New here, are you? Got plenty of money, have you? Enough, said the kid. You think so? It won't do you much good, anyway. Look, four loaves of bread and a bun, I can't say fairer than that. I can get a terrier for ten loaves and they're mad for rats, no? Well, when you're hungry you'll give it away for half a slice of bread and scrape one and think you've done well, believe me. He strode off. Maurice wriggled out of the kid's arms, and landed lightly on the cobbles. Honestly, if only I was good at ventriloquism we could make a fortune, he grumbled. Ventriloquism, said the kid, watching the man's retreating back. It's where you open and shut your mouth and I do the talking, said Maurice. Why didn't you sell me? I could have been back in ten minutes. I heard of a man who made a fortune selling homing pigeons, and he only had the one. Don't you think there's something wrong with a town where people d pay more than a dollar for a loaf of bread, said the kid. And pay half a dollar just for a rat tail. Just so long as they've got enough money left to pay the piper, said Maurice. Bit of luck there already being a plague of rats here, eh? Quick, pat me on the head, there's a girl watching us. The kid looked up. There was a girl watching them. People were passing up and down the street, and some of them walked between the kid and the girl, but she stood stock still and just stared at him. And at Maurice. She had the same nail you to the wall look that he associated with peaches. She looked like the kind of person who asked questions. And her hair was too red and her nose was too long. And she wore a long black dress with black lace fringing. No good comes of that sort of thing. She marched across the street and confronted the kid. You're new, aren't you? Come here looking for work, have you? Probably sacked from your last job, I expect. Probably because you fell asleep, and things got spoiled. That was probably what it was. Or you ran away because your master beat you with a big stick, although... She added, as another idea struck her, you probably deserved it because of being lazy. And then you probably stole the cat, knowing how much people would pay for a cat here. And you must have gone mad with hunger because you were talking to the cat and everyone knows that cats can't talk. Can't say a single word, said Maurice. And probably you're a mysterious boy who the girl stopped and gave Maurice a puzzled look. He arched his back and said PRPPT, which is cat language for biscuits. Did that cat just say something, she demanded. I thought that everyone knew that cats can't talk, said the kid. Ah, but maybe you were apprenticed to a wizard, said the girl. Yes, that sounds about right. That'll do for now. You were an apprentice to a wizard but you fell asleep and let the cauldron of bubbling green stuff boil over and he threatened to turn you into a, a, a gerbil, said Maurice, helpfully. A gerbil, and you stole his magical cat because you hated it so much and what's a gerbil? Did that cat just say gerbil? Don't look at me, said the kid. I'm just standing here. All right and then you brought the cat here because you know there's a terrible famine and that's why you were going to sell it and that man would have given you ten dollars, you know, if you'd held out for it. Ten dollars is too much money even for a good ratter, said the kid. Ratter. He wasn't interested in catching rats, said the red-haired girl. Everyone's hungry here. There's at least two meals on that cat. What? You eat cats here, 
said Maurice, his tail fluffing like a brush. The girl leaned down to Maurice with a dreadful grin, just like the one that Peaches always wore when she'd won an argument with him, and prodded him on the nose with a finger. Got you, she said. You fell for a very simple trick. I think you two had better come with me, don't you? Or I'll scream. And people listen to me when I'm screaming. Chapter 3 Never Go Into the Dark Wood, My Friend, Said Ratty Rupert. There are bad things in there. From Mr. Bunsey has an adventure far below Morris's paws, the rats were creeping through the undertown of Bad Blintz. Old towns are like that. People build down as well as up. Sellers butt against other sellers, and some of the sellers get forgotten except by creatures that want to stay out of sight. In the thick, warm, damp darkness a voice said, All right, who's got the matches? Me, dangerous beans. Feeds four. Well done, young rat. And who has the candle? Me, sir. Two I'm bit size. Good. Put it down and peaches will light it. There was a lot of scuffling in the darkness. Not all the rats had got used to the idea of making fire, and some were getting out of the way. There was a scratching noise, and then the match flared. Holding the match with both front paws, Peaches lit the candle stub. The flame swelled for a moment and settled down to a steady glow. Can you really see it? said Ham Pork. Yes, sir, said Dangerous Beans. I am not completely blind. I can tell the difference between light and dark. You know, said Ham Pork, watching the flame suspiciously, I don't like it at all, even so. Darkness was good enough for our parents. It'll end in trouble. Besides, setting fire to a candle is a waste of perfectly good food. We have to be able to control the fire, sir, said Dangerous Beans calmly. With the flame we make a statement to the darkness. We say. We are separate. We say. We are not just rats. We say. We are the clan. Thrumpf, said Ham Pork, which was his usual response when he didn't understand what had just been said. Just lately he'd been thrumpfing a lot. I've heard the younger rats are saying that the shadows frighten them, said Peaches. Why, said Ham Pork. They're not frightened of complete darkness, are they? Darkness is ratty. Being in the dark is what a rat is all about. It's odd, said Peaches, but we didn't know the shadows were there until we had the light. One of the younger rats timorously raised a paw. Um, and even when the light has gone out, we know the shadows are still around, it said. Dangerous Beans turned towards the young rat. You're, he said. Delicious, said the younger rat. Well, delicious, said Dangerous Beans, in a kindly voice, being afraid of shadows is all part of us becoming more intelligent, I think. Your mind is working out that there's a you, and there's also everything outside you. So now you're not just frightened of things that you can see and hear and smell, but also of things that you can, sort of, see inside your head. Learning to face the shadows outside helps us to fight the shadows inside. And you can control all the darkness. It's a big step forward. Well done. Delicious looked slightly proud, but mostly nervous. I don't see the point, myself said Ham Pork. We used to do all right on the dump. I was never scared of anything. We were prey to every stray cat and hungry dog, sir, said Dangerous Beans. Oh, well, if we're going to talk about cats, growled Ham Pork. I think we can trust Maurice, sir, said Dangerous Beans. Perhaps not when it comes to money, I admit but he is very good at not eating people who talk, you know. He checks, every time. 
You can trust a cat to be a cat, said Ham Pork. Talking or not? Yes, sir. But we are different, and so is he. I believe he is a decent cat at heart. Ahem. That remains to be seen, said Peaches. But now we are here, let's get organized. Ham Pork growled. Who are you to say let's get organized, he said sharply. Are you the leader, young female who refuses to RLLK with me? No. I am the leader. It's my job to say let's get organized. Yes, sir, said Peaches, crouching low. How would you like us to be organized, sir? Ham Pork stared at her. He looked at the waiting rats, with their packs and bundles, and then around at the ancient cellar, and then back to the still crouching Peaches. Just, get organized, he muttered. Don't bother me with details. I am the leader. And he stalked off into the shadows. When he'd gone, Peaches and Dangerous Beans looked around the cellar, which was filled with trembling shadows created by the candle light. A trickle of water ran down one crusted wall. Here and there stones had fallen out, leaving inviting holes. Earth covered the floor, and there were no human footprints in it. An ideal base, said Dangerous Beans. It smells secret and safe. A perfect place for rats. Right, said a voice. And you know what's worrying me about that. The rat called Darkton stepped into the candlelight, and hitched up one of his belts of tools. A lot of the watching rats suddenly paid attention. People listened to Ham Pork because he was the leader, but they listened to Darkton because he was often telling you things that you really, really needed to know if you wanted to go on living. He was big and lean and tough, and spent most of his time taking traps apart to see how they worked. What is worrying you, Darkton, asked Dangerous Beans. There aren't any rats here. Except us. Rat tunnels, yes. But we've seen no rats. No rats at all. A town like this should be full of them. Oh, they're probably scared of us, said Peaches. Darkton tapped the side of his scarred muzzle. Maybe, he said. But things don't smell right. Thinking is a great invention, but we were given noses and it pays to listen to them. Be extra careful. He turned to the assembled rats and raised his voice. Okay, people. You know the drill, he shouted. In front of me, in your platoons, now. It didn't take long for the rats to form three groups. They'd had plenty of practice. Very nice, said Darkton, as the last few shuffled into position. Right. This is tricky territory, troops, so we're going to be careful. Darkton was unusual among the rats because he wore things. When the rats had discovered books. And the whole idea of books was still a difficult one for most of the older ones. They found, in the bookshop they invaded every night, the book. This book was amazing. Even before Peaches and Donut Enter had learned how to read human words, they'd been amazed by the pictures. There were animals in there wearing clothes. There was a rabbit who walked on its hind legs and wore a blue suit. There was a rat in a hat, and he wore a sword and a big red waistcoat, complete with a watch on a chain. Even the snake had a collar and tie. And all of them talked and none of them ate any of the others and... And this was the unbelievable part. They all talked to humans, who treated them like, well, smaller humans. There were no traps, no poisons. Admittedly, according to Peaches, who was painstakingly working her way through the book, and sometimes read out parts, Oily the snake was a bit of a rascal, but nothing truly bad happened. Even when the rabbit got lost in the dark wood he just had a bit of a scare. Yes, Mr. Bunsey has an adventure was the cause of much discussion amongst the changelings. 
What was it for? Was it, as dangerous beings believed, a vision of some bright future? Had it been made by humans? The shop had been for humans, true, but surely even humans wouldn't make a book about Ratty Rupert the Rat, who wore a hat, and poison rats under the floorboards at the same time. Would they? How mad would anything have to be to think like that? Some of the younger rats had suggested that perhaps clothes were more important than everyone thought. They'd tried wearing waistcoats, but it had been very difficult to bite out the pattern, they couldn't make the buttons work and, frankly, the things got caught on every splinter and were very hard to run in. Hats just fell off. Darkton just thought that humans were mad, as well as bad. But the pictures in the book had given him an idea. What he wore was not so much a waistcoat as a network of wide belts, easy to wriggle in and out of. On them he'd sewn pockets. And that had been a good idea, like giving yourself extra paws. To hold all the things he needed, like metal rods and bits of wire. Some of the rest of the squad had taken up the idea, too. You never knew what you were going to need next, on the trap disposal squad. It was a tough, ratty life. The rods and wires jangled as Darkton walked up and down in front of his teams. He stopped in front of one large group of younger rats. All right, number three platoon, you're on whittling duty, he said. Go and have a good drink. Ooh, we're always on whittling, a rat complained. Darkton pounced on it and faced it nose to nose, until it backed away. That's cause you're good at it, my lad. Your mother raised you to be a whittler, so off you go and do what comes naturally. Nothing puts humans off like seeing that rats have been there before, if you catch my meaning. And if you get the opportunity, do some gnawing as well. And run around under the floorboards and squeak. And remember, no one is to move in until they get the all clear from the trap squad. To the water, now, at the double. Hub. 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 One two, one two, one two. The platoon headed off, at speed. Darkton turned to number two platoon. They were some of the older rats, scarred and bitten and ragged, some of them with stubs of tails or no tails at all, some of them missing a paw or an ear or an eye. In fact although there were about twenty of them, they had between them only enough bits to make up about seventeen complete rats. But because they were old they were cunning, because a rat who isn't cunning and shifty and suspicious doesn't become an old rat. They'd all been grown up when the intelligence came. They were more set in their old ways. Ham Pork always said he liked them that way. They still had a lot of basic rattiness the kind of raw cunning that would get you out of the traps that overexcited intelligence got you into. They thought with their noses. And you didn't have to tell them where to whittle. All right, people, you know the drill, said Darkton. I want to see lots of cheeky stuff. Stealing the food out of cat's bowls, pies from under the cook's noses false teeth from out of old men's mouths said a small rat who seemed to be dancing on the spot while he stood there. His feet moved all the time, tippity-tapping on the cellar floor. He wore a hat, too, a battered, homemade thing out of straw. He was the only rat who could make a hat work, by wedging his ears through it. He said to get ahead, you had to get a hat. That was a fluke, sardines. I bet you can't do it again, said Darkton grinning. And don't keep on telling the kids how you went for a swim in someone's bathtub. Yeah, I know you did, but I don't want to lose anyone who can't scramble out of a slippery tub. Anyway, if I don't hear ladies screaming and running out of their kitchens within ten minutes I'll know you're not the rats I think you are. Well? Why are you all standing around? Get on with it. And... Sardines. Yes, boss. Easy on the tap dancing this time, all right. 
I just got these dancing feet, boss. And do you have to keep wearing that stupid hat? Darkton continued, grinning again. Yes, boss. Sardines was one of the older rats, but most of the time you wouldn't know it. He danced and joked and never got into fights. He'd lived in a theater and once ate a whole box of grease paint. It seemed to have got into his blood. And no going on ahead of the trap squad, said Darkton. Sardines grinned. Ah, boss, can't I have any fun? He danced after the rest of them, towards the holes in the walls. Darkton moved on, to number one platoon. It was the smallest. You had to be a certain kind of rat to last a long time in the trap disposal squad. You had to be slow, and patient, and thorough. You had to have a good memory. You had to be careful. You could join the squad if you were fast and slapdash and hasty. You just didn't last very long. He looked them up and down, and smiled. He was proud of these rats. Okay, people, you know it all by now, he said. You don't need a long lecture from me. Just remember that this is a new town so we don't know what we're going to find. There are bound to be plenty of new types of traps, but we learn fast, don't we? Poisons, too. They might be using stuff we've never run across before, so be careful. Never rush, never run. We don't want to be like the first mouse, eh? No, Darkton, the rats chorused dutifully. I said, what mouse don't we want to be like? Darkton demanded. We don't want to be like the first mouse, shouted the rats. Right. What mouse do we want to be like? The second mouse, Darkton, said the rats, who'd had this lesson dinned into them many times. Right. And why do we want to be like the second mouse? Because the second mouse gets the cheese, Darkton. Good, said Darkton. Inbrin will take squad two. Best before? You're promoted, you take squad three, and I hope you're as good as old farmhouse was right up until the time she forgot how to disengage the trip catch on a snippet and poison rat snapper number five. Overconfidence is our enemy. So if you see anything suspicious, any little trays you don't recognize, anything with wires and springs and stuff, you mark it and send a runner to me yes. A young rat was holding up its paw. Yes. What's your name, miss? E.R. Nourishing, sir, said the rat. E.R., can I ask a question, sir? Are you new in this platoon, nourishing, said Darkton. Yes, sir. Transferred out of the light with Lurs, sir. Ah, they thought you'd be good at trap disposal, did they? Nourishing looked uneasy, but there was no going back now. E.R., not really, sir. They said I couldn't be any worse than I am at whittling, sir. There was general laughter from the ranks. How can a rat not be good at that, said Darkton. It's just so, so, so embarrassing, sir, said Nourishing. Darkton sighed to himself. All this new thinking was producing some strange things. He personally approved of the idea of the right place, but some of the ideas the kids were coming up with were, odd. All right he said. What was your question, nourishing? E.R., you said the second mouse gets the cheese, sir. That's right. That's the squad motto, nourishing. Remember it. It is your friend. Yes, sir. I will, sir. But, doesn't the first mouse get something, sir? Darkton stared at the young rat. He was slightly impressed that she stared back, instead of cringing. I can see you're going to be a valuable addition to the squad, nourishing, he said. 
Audiobook generated by Read with the Ears.